The heart of the soul, emotional awareness, abridged by Gary Zukov and Linda Francis, read by Vincent Bagnall. The new species. The need to feel safe, valuable, and loved is at the core of human experience. It is a need that is as deep as the need for food and shelter. This need has created hunting, agriculture, and shelter. It has also created clothing, communities, nation states, and education. It has created science, transportation, and communication technologies, furniture, and every object that is not found in nature. It is a need that has propelled us to observe carefully what lies around us and to use it effectively. Since the origin of the human species, the need to feel safe, valuable, and loved has focused our attention outward toward what is external. It has caused us to study the mineral, plant, and animal kingdoms and to use them in the service of ourselves. Even in cultures in which these kingdoms were honored, such as native cultures, the goal was a harmonious relationship with them that enhanced the probabilities of human survival. We are so used to reaching outward to satisfy that need that we scarcely notice it. It has become natural, and for millennia it has worked, creating shelters, finding food, raising children, and sending them to school have made countless human beings feel safe, valuable, and loved. Neither the information age nor the service industry can provide compassion and wisdom. No individual can give compassion or wisdom to another, yet all individuals are now feeling a hunger for them, and that hunger will not quit the starving mothers and their starving children, the homeless and the unloved, the poor and the sick, the prisoners and their captors, and the billions who live in inner anguish are with us always because we are beginning to realize that we are inseparable from one another. Their pain is ours, and our pain is theirs. Their joy is ours, and our joy is theirs. Survival to experience needless pain to give and receive brutality, and to oppress and exploit one another and the earth is not satisfying, no matter how secure our survival becomes. Spiritual growth is now replacing survival as the central objective of the human experience. Spiritual growth is becoming attractive to individuals from every culture, race, sex, economic status, and religion. And even while so many humans suffer from brutality, poverty, and starvation, the goal of spiritual growth is calling us to greater accomplishments than providing protection, food, and money. It is creating new and deeper understanding of who we are. Do this simple exercise of looking at your life to see why you do the things that you do and have the things that you have. Look deeply. Spend some quiet time. Consider why you eat, exercise, have the car that you do, have the partner you do, have the home that you do, and ask yourself, do I do this for survival? To feel better about myself? To feel more secure? Spiritual growth, looking inward, is replacing the pursuit of external power, reaching outward to manipulate and control as the cure for the insecurity at the core of human experience. Instead of rearranging external circumstances in order to make ourselves feel more safe, valuable, and loved, we are learning how to look inside ourselves to find the roots of our insecurities and to pull them. Getting a new wife or husband, a larger home or a better car are all ways of pursuing external power, attempting to make yourself feel more whole and secure by manipulating and controlling the external world. And so is every use of intelligence, beauty, wealth, education, muscles, and the latest hairstyle. 
Every attempt to acquire external power now produces only violence and destruction. The pursuit of external power produces physical violence and destruction between nations. You can see this in every newscast. The pursuit of external power produces emotional violence and destruction between individuals. You can verify this yourself. Try persuading a friend to do something that he or she doesn't want to do and persist in that effort. It is not skill, talent, homes, or cars that produce destructive consequences. It is the intention to use them to manipulate and control others in order to make yourself feel valuable and loved. It is not the development of the Internet, space colonies, and increased agricultural efficiency that produce them. It is the intention of the human species to see itself as superior to all else by creating them. So long as we reach outward in any way to soften the pain of feeling unworthy or the terror of not belonging, we bring violence and destruction into our lives, individually and collectively. Take an inventory. Consider every activity that you do daily. Go through your day, beginning with when you wake. And take an inventory of your actions and your belongings. Ask these questions for everything that you do or have. Do I do or have this to survive? Do I do or have this to feel more secure? Do I do or have this to feel better about myself? Do I do or have this to feel better than others? Do I do or have this to be safer? For every yes, ask yourself, how could I see the things that I do or have differently? For example, instead of eating to make myself feel good or to feel more secure, I eat so that I can take care of my body instead of having my husband or wife to feel better about myself or safer. I am with my husband or wife to be in a true partnership. Make this a habit. Before you do anything, ask yourself, what is my intention for doing this? Heart of the Soul 2 Authentic power. Authentic power is the alignment of your personality with your soul. Creating authentic power is dramatically different from the pursuit of external power. We know how to pursue external power well because we have been pursuing it since the origin of our species. The creation of authentic power is a lifetime endeavor. It requires becoming aware moment by moment, of what you are feeling and the decisions that you're making. The creation of authentic power confronts you with the most unhealthy parts of yourself, the parts that blame, criticize, judge, resent, envy, and hate others, yourself, and the universe. These are the parts that must be uncovered, acknowledged, and changed. They are also the parts that most want to change in others, rather than be changed themselves. Now, how do you know that you've encountered a part of yourself that wants to change others and the world, rather than be changed itself? Notice when you feel right. You feel defensive. You feel angry. You blame others, yourself, for the universe. You are self-critical. You are upset. You judge others. Anytime you are in a painful reaction to something or someone, begin to notice when you feel these things as you go through your day. Each time you notice one of these reactions, congratulate yourself. Changing your life does not mean getting a new job husband or wife, or moving away from your parents or back in with them. It means locating 
within you impulses to make yourself feel worthy by attempting to control others or the circumstances around you and changing them. When you become your own source of worthiness, you will still buy clothes, live in a house, and get haircuts. The difference is that you will not do these things to influence or impress others. You will choose your intentions consciously, not unconsciously. You will be free to say and do what is most appropriate, guided by your compassionate heart and your wisdom. You will live without fear. You will give all that you are born to give and receive all that the universe offers to you. You will live in harmony with others while remaining true to yourself. What do you want to change? Make a list of what you want to change in yourself. For example, power struggles I have with my partner, uh, my discomfort with authority figures, my resentment that she got the job I wanted. Authentic power is being fully engaged in the present moment. It is being creative without limitation. It's enjoying the company of all life. It is caring and being cared for. It is being aware of everything that you are feeling all of the time. It is living in joy. It is being so powerful that the idea of showing power through the use of force is not even a part of your own consciousness. And this is the life that now calls you. The values, perceptions, and goals of the new human species do not emerge fully developed. We are all engaged in a process that is taking each of us to a fuller, richer, more comprehensive perception and understanding of ourselves and the universe. We are beginning to glimpse a new way of living on the earth that is more fulfilling and more powerful than was possible for the old human species. Authentic power is the human experience without the limitations of fear, self-doubt, and self-hatred. Creating authentic power is a proactive lifetime endeavor that requires your intention and effort. Authentic power is the experience of fulfillment, no matter what you're doing. It's knowing that the person you are with is the person you're supposed to be with. Many people have brief experiences of authentic power. and You may have felt it while you were cooking a meal for a friend or caring for someone who's ill. You may have felt it while getting on a bus to take you somewhere you knew you should be. Remembering. Take some quiet time and remember the times in your life when you had experiences of authentic power. Remember how you felt and what you were thinking. How have these experiences had an impact on your life? The first step in creating authentic power requires you to become aware of everything that you're feeling all the time. It's not enough to experience peaks of emotions such as anger, jealousy, despair, and joy. Your emotions are the force field of your soul. You cannot align your personality with your soul without becoming conscious of your emotions. The Earth School is a learning environment in which each individual encounters circumstances tailored for his or her spiritual growth. Recognizing the potential for spiritual growth that each moment presents you and moving into that potential is your job. An authentically empowered person is in partnership with the universe. The more he or she develops this partnership, the more authentically empowered his or her life becomes. This is the journey of spiritual growth. We are all students in the Earth School, and we are all taking the same course, authentic power, what it is, how to create it, and how to use it. Emotions. Emotions are currents of energy that run through you. They are more than consequences of chemical interactions, 
hormones and excesses or deficiencies of neurotransmitters. They are five sensory explanations of the emotional process. They result from extensive study of neural, chemical, and molecular structures. You also possess energy. All of your systems that possess things that the five senses can detect, such as air, food, and blood, reflect another processing system that the five senses cannot detect. And that system processes energy. Energy continually flows into the top of your head, moves downward through your torso, and then returns to where it came from. This system operates every moment you are alive, just as your respiratory and circulatory systems do. As energy is processed at different locations and in different ways, different emotions result. You can change the experiences that are caused by food, moving through your digestive system by eating different foods. The energy that flows into it is always pure and wholesome. It remains that way as it moves through your energy system, is transformed, and then returned to where it came from. You cannot change the nature of this energy, but you can change how you experience it by changing the way that it is processed. Say to yourself, the energy that flows into me is always pure and wholesome. Now, you cannot grow spiritually without learning how to detach from your emotions and understand them as products of the way energy is processed in your energy system. If you become angry, for example, and you cannot detach from your anger, you'll shout, withdraw emotionally, or enact one of the many other ways that angry people express themselves. But when you become happy and you cannot detach from your happiness, you become uncontrollably elated, buoyant, or exhilarated. Recognizing emotions. Feel your body in the area of your head, then your neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Notice if there is any tightness, pain, or other sensations. The next time you feel angry, hurt, upset, or jealous, notice these same areas in your body and see how they feel then. Your emotions are the best of friends. They do not leave you. They continually bring to your attention what you need to know. Every emotion is a message. Think of a time when you felt a strong emotion such as anger, happiness, jealousy, or resentment. Close your eyes and go back to that time. Take a few minutes to feel what this emotion felt like in your body. Where did you feel it? Was it in your chest, stomach, pelvis, neck, throat? Remember what thoughts you were having when you experienced this emotion. If you were angry, were you blaming yourself, someone else, or a situation? Remember what you said when you experienced this emotion. For example, if you were resentful, did you say something hurtful? How did you behave? If you were happy, did you laugh or dance? If you knew that your emotion was a message from your soul, would you have changed what you did or said while you experienced this emotion? What would you have done differently? The Earth School. Even if you are not aware of your emotions, they are always being produced inside you. The energy that flows through your energy system never stops, and your energy system never stops functioning. Each emotion has different characteristics. Anger disappears more quickly than jealousy. The need for revenge is more persistent than jealousy. And some emotions come more frequently than others, and some stay longer than others. And this flow of emotions is like a shower. The shower of your emotions continues until you leave the earth school, until you die. It is a flow that never stops, whether you pay attention to it or not. You may daydream for a while, but sooner or later you wake up in the shower. Your emotions always return, too, each time they show you where and how energy is being processed in your energy system. When you understand that system, you will know why you are experiencing an emotion and how you can change it, if you want to change it. Everyone in the Earth School takes the same course, authentic power. 
but different students need to take different classes in order to complete it. Every painful emotion is a class. If you are angry, you are in that class. If you are jealous, you are in that class. If you are angry and jealous, you are in both classes. But not every class on anger is the same, and not every class on jealousy is the same. Becoming emotionally withdrawn when you are angry is one class. Becoming bossy and loud when you are angry is another. Every healthy emotion such as appreciation, gratitude, contentment, and joy is also a class. There are different ways of experiencing each of these emotions too, and each of them is yet another class. There are two types of classes in the Earth School, classes about fear and classes about love, anger, vengefulness, sadness, and greed are classes about fear. Joy and gratitude are classes about love. When you begin to see your emotions in this way, all of the circumstances that you encounter in your life will become meaningful to you. You'll begin to look at them all as circumstances that are perfect for bringing your attention to inner dynamics that you need to examine and change. And these are your painful emotions. List your classes. Now take some time to look inside yourself and see what classes you're enrolled in. For example, anger, sorrow, jealousy, rage, fear, vengefulness, resentfulness, appreciation, gratitude, contentment, joy, etc. Make a list. Notice whether these classes are about fear or love. If you're brave enough, do this with a friend. Your emotions become the focus of your attention, not the people or circumstances that appear to be causing your emotions. Instead of being angry at an individual or circumstance or depressed, jealous, or frightened, be grateful that they have brought particular emotions to your attention. Instead of trying to change circumstances or people, examine the emotions you are experiencing. These emotions come from inside you, not from outside. They come as old friends. And you may think that your anger is justified, but if you look at your anger, instead of the injustice that you think causes it, you will see that your anger is very familiar. You have felt the same way at other times and in other places with other people in other circumstances. The times, places, people, and circumstances change, but your anger does not. Nor does your sadness, vengefulness, or fear. When you make this connection, you're in a position to change your life. You cannot change all of the people that make you angry, jealous, or sad, but you can change yourself. Looking inward instead of focusing on outward circumstances is an important step in the process of spiritual development. Be a student. Every morning when you wake up, remind yourself you're a student in the Earth School and that everything that happens this day is to help you learn. Every night, go over all the things that happened in school did you remember that you were in school? How often did you remember? What classes did you attend today? Anger, joy, jealousy, sorrow. The universe is your tutor. Your classroom is your life. Everything that happens within it is part of your custom-crafted curriculum. You cannot fail this school. Sooner or later, you will graduate from it. You can ignore your assignments and take the same classes as many times as you choose. You can also apply yourself and accelerate your process. But your task as a student in the Earth School is not to change your parents, boss, employees, or classmates. It is to change yourself. Your most painful emotions show you what you are most resistant to changing. They're the ones that occur most often because you have failed to do the homework, and your progress in the Earth School has halted 
at that class. Only you can make permanent changes in yourself. Processing energy, part one. Now your energy system has seven centers. As energy flows through each center in your energy system, it creates different experiences in you. So those experiences are your emotions. In order to understand your emotions, it is necessary to understand these different energy centers, where they are and what they do. Your energy system is not detectable by X-ray or magnetic resonance imaging. Its centers cannot be found in particular organs or cells, but they're as real as your organs or cells. The seventh center is the crown of your head. And this is where energy enters your energy system. This center connects you with the non-physical universe, and that connection remains active as long as you live. When you go home, return to non-physical reality, your energy system ceases to function and your personality dies. But your personality is in your body, your intuitional structure, and the particular ways that you perceive, think, and feel. Your personality was born on a certain date. It will die on a certain date. And that is the date that your energy system stops functioning. It's also the date that your other systems, such as digestive, respiratory, and circulatory, stop functioning. As long as you live, energy flows into your energy system through the center at the crown of your head and moves downward to the base of your torso. There are two ways that energy can leave your energy system. In fear and doubt, or love and trust. Throughout your life, you choose from moment to moment whether you will learn through fear and doubt or love and trust. No matter which way you choose, energy continues to enter your energy system at the crown of your head and it leaves through each of the centers in your energy system. No matter where or how energy leaves your energy system, it produces an emotion. Processing energy part two. Every emotion is a physical experience. Emotions are physical sensations that occur in different parts of your body. Your energy system continually produces physical sensations in the vicinity of each of its centers. Those sensations are your emotions. When the energy that is flowing downward through the centers in your energy system reaches the fifth center, it is easy to feel the sensations that it produces. This center is in the vicinity of your throat. When energy leaves the fifth center in love and trust, you express yourself clearly and easily. Your voice is full and strong. It does not waver. It is not tentative. When energy leaves this center in fear and doubt, your expression is constricted and you cannot convey what you feel. Your throat or neck becomes tight. Speaking is like forcing water through a hose that has been pinched. The dribble that makes it through the constriction is small compared with the force of the water dammed up behind it. Your voice is weak and hoarse. You cough or clear your throat frequently. These symptoms, a clear, strong voice or weak, fragile voice, a relaxed throat or tight throat, tell you whether energy is leaving this center in love and trust or in fear and doubt. The departure of energy from your energy system is a real event that produces physical experiences which can be observed easily when you focus your attention on your body. Free speech. Imagine talking to a friend you feel safe with. Now notice how you feel in the area of your throat and neck. Notice the quality of your voice. Do you feel any obstruction in your throat? Do you feel you are expressing yourself clearly? Imagine talking to someone who's intimidating. How do your throat and neck feel now? What is the quality of your voice? Do you feel any obstruction in your throat? Do you feel that you're expressing what you want to express? Now practice doing these exercises the next time you're in a real conversation. Notice whether your throat and neck feel relaxed or tense, whether your voice is clear and strong 
or weak and raspy, and whether you are really saying what you want to express. Open your heart. Practice opening your heart by thinking of a time when you felt love and openness for someone, your child, grandchild, partner, friend, or even stranger. Remember the situation and what you are feeling in the area of your heart. When you feel your heart is closed, your chest hurts. Let your self experience the pain in your chest. Breathe deeply. And at the same time, remember that special time when you felt open and loving. Go back to it in your imagination. Keep thinking about it and breathing deeply until you feel yourself begin to relax, even if only a little. Remember, emotional pain of any kind is a reminder to stop and look inside. What me worry? Well, get in touch with the physical sensations in your body when you're worrying. For example, about the rent, what to fix for dinner, if your friend is upset with you, if the workman did the job right without you. Feel the physical sensations in your body, especially in the area of your solar plexus, otherwise known as the third center. When energy leaves this center in love and trust, you have no doubt that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish. You do not fear failure. You know you are the right person in the right place at the right time. Every challenge stimulates you. You are comfortable with your abilities and grateful for them. Earth Connection. Every day, take a few minutes to appreciate the earth. Stand, sit, or lie on the earth, the grass, the ground, or the floor. Imagine yourself to be held, to be nurtured by the earth. Even if you're lying on a carpet on a floor, you are being held by the earth. A floor and carpet are holding you, but what is holding them? Spend at least five minutes and trust yourself completely to the earth for a few minutes each day. This is sacred time. Making friends with your emotions. Imagine seeing each of your emotions as a present. Your anger, joy, sadness, resentment. Each one's a surprise. Say to yourself, I wonder what I'm going to learn about myself from this present. Adding color. Energy is always leaving each of the centers in your energy system. And as it does, it creates an experience that we call emotion. So when you think angry thoughts, you feel tightness in your chest. Butterflies in your stomach, created by energy leaving your energy system through these centers in fear and doubt. As you fantasize a sexual interaction, you feel attracted to someone and maybe queasiness in your stomach. As you enjoy wildflowers in a meadow, you breathe deeply and feel pleasant sensations in your chest, and so on. Practicing the scan. Scan your body. Allow yourself to experience what sensations you are feeling near each energy center, beginning at the crown of your head and moving downward to the base of your torso. If you do not feel anything in one center, go to the next, then start over. Do this several times until you begin to experience sensations, particularly in your neck, chest, and stomach areas. Are these sensations pleasant or uncomfortable? Imagine that you could see each emotion, each physical sensation near a particular energy center as a different color. Energy leaving a particular center in fear and doubt and causing a particular painful sensation would light up that center in a particular way. But energy is always leaving each of the centers in your energy system and lighting up each one in a particular way as it does. When energy leaves through every center in love and trust, your energy system is beautiful and radiant. When energy leaves through every center in your energy system in fear and doubt, your energy system is less pleasing to see and much less pleasing to experience. So feeling your emotions 
is a physical experience. And spiritual growth requires you to become aware of everything that you are feeling all the time. The chronic release of energy and fear and doubt from any center in your energy system produces physical symptoms in the vicinity of that center. Those symptoms may be back pain, sore throat, heart pain, lung congestion, indigestion, headache, urinary infection, and on and on. There are numerous symptoms created by the release of energy and fear and doubt from different centers in your energy system. All of them are painful. There are also numerous symptoms created by the release of energy from different centers in love and trust. All of them feel good. Emotional awareness is preventive medicine. Medical treatment of a physical dysfunction is emergency treatment of a symptom that has developed over a long time. The cause of physical dysfunction, whether it appears, wherever it appears, is the release of energy from your energy system in fear and doubt for an extended time. Releasing energy from your energy system in love and trust produces health and vitality. The present moment. You are always in the present moment. You are not always aware that you are in the present moment. The present moment continues with your awareness or without it. The difference is one of power. When you are aware in the present moment, you have the option of power. When you are not aware in the present moment, you have no power. Not having power means being under the control of external circumstances. Having the option to create power means you are able to decide what you will say next and do next and the consequences you will create with your words and actions. All possibilities exist in the present moment. When you are aware of the present moment, you have access to all possibilities that the present moment offers. Most people are not aware of the present moment and the options available to them are very limited. When they are offended, they get angry and shout or withdraw. When they are tempted by alcohol, they drink it. When they are jealous, they become focused on a narrow part of the vast array of experience that presents itself moment by moment. The vast array is all contained in the present moment. Becoming aware of the present moment gives access to that vast array. And with that vast array of experience comes numerous possibilities. It's not possible to become aware of the present moment by examining or studying or thinking about external circumstances. The more absorbed you become in these activities, the less aware of the present moment you are. When you are fixated on your computer, for example, time seems to go by very quickly and you don't have enough of it. Before you're finished with what you want to do, dinner is ready or it is bedtime and you stay up late to do even more. Your inner landscape is richer than your outer landscape. No matter how magnificent the sunrise you are seeing might be, or how awesome the night sky above you, or how immense the turbulent ocean rushing toward you, it is more diverse and more meaningful. It is your inner landscape that gives meaning to your outer landscape. A golden sunset does not fill you with appreciation. Your inner landscape does. When you mistake the circumstances that you encounter in your outer landscape for the experiences of your inner landscape, you miss the point entirely. The point is that you're on the earth in order to grow spiritually and to give gifts that only you are capable of giving. Those gifts do not originate in the outer world, but in the deepest parts of yourself. They are your potential waiting to spring into being like seeds in the earth, waiting to sprout. Your earth is your inner landscape. The more attention you pay to it, the more familiar you become with it, and the more familiar you become with it, the more able you are to see what you want to cultivate and what you want to remove. Your emotions are the force field of your soul, not products of hormones, enzymes, and neurotransmitters. They are the experiences coming to you in a dramatically intimate way of parts of your soul. 
painful emotions such as anger, fear, jealousy, and vengefulness are experiences of the parts of your soul that your soul desires to heal. When you're aware of everything that you're feeling all the time, you are in continual communication with your soul. Learning how to listen to that communication and act on it is the purpose of your being in the earth school. Lost in thought, give yourself some time to explore whether you avoid listening to the communication with your soul, feeling your emotions by escaping into thoughts. Do you spend time planning for the future or dreading it? Do you occupy yourself with the what ifs of your life? If the answer to these questions is yes, allow at least five minutes each morning and five minutes each evening to listen to the communications with your soul, to feel what you are feeling and what you are feeling it, and, and where you're feeling it in your energy system. Academy Awards, including Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Director, Best Cinematography, and Best Musical Score. It's your favorite kind of movie, your favorite actress and actor play the leading roles. Screenplay is superb. You're fascinated from the moment the opening scene begins, and at the very end, it has beautiful closing music. You exit the theater, still thinking about what you've experienced, and discover that it's raining outside, or sunny, or windy. But until then, you forgot completely about everything except the movie. It was an experience unto itself. Its effect on you was so powerful that you forgot where you were, what you were doing before you came, and what you planned to do afterward. You were unaware of the people in the theater with you, and of the employees in the theater selling tickets to the next performance, popping corn and cleaning the lobby. You were unaware of your job, your school, and your friends. That is what it's like to be fixated on the events of your life. You forget everything else. When you are fixated on the events of your life, your attention is absorbed. The circumstances around you make you laugh and cry. You know when you are laughing and crying. But the laughter and tears happen without your noticing much about them. You are focused on what you think caused them. Now, Imagine going to the movie with someone who is very attractive to you. You might have felt this way the first time you went out with your first girlfriend or boyfriend. Perhaps you felt this way when you first discovered that you wanted to marry your wife or husband. The movie's no longer what you notice. You're aware of your friend. You notice when she moves. You are aware of when his arm touches yours. You feel each other's presence throughout the movie. You do not forget about each other, no matter how exciting the movie becomes. You are the center of each other's attention. Awareness of the present moment requires detachment from both your outer landscape and your inner landscape. Work on moving one step back from what you're feeling so you are no longer blinded by it or unaware of it as a feeling. Move one step away so you can let it begin to work its way through you without penetrating as deeply as it does in terms of creating action and negative thoughts and emotional withdrawals and all the other reactions that's created within you in the past. Become one step detached from what you are feeling and every time you are able to, you will become more and more detached. The difference between being detached from your emotions and being swept away by them is the difference between standing on a bridge looking down on rushing water below you and being in the water. When you're in the water, you can see only a little of it, the water that's around you. When you're angry, for example, you can only experience your anger. When you're on the bridge, you can see the stream, you can see your anger approach, rush under the bridge and move downstream as jealousy approaches rushes under the bridge and is replaced by a feeling of inferiority and so on, that is detachment. On the bridge, use this practice when you are feeling any painful emotion, such as anger, jealousy, sadness, depression, vengefulness, or greed. Imagine that you are in a river of these emotions. Now imagine yourself getting out of the water and walking out onto a bridge. You look down at the river and watch it rushing below you. 
the water in the river represents your emotions. Let this water flow below you while you watch. At the same time, feel the river of energy flowing through your body. Allow yourself to feel these emotions with detachment, like watching the river flow below you while you are on the bridge. Practice this each time you are caught in a river of emotions. Detachment allows you to remain aware of what you feel while the events of your life unfold. When you are not detached from your emotions, you cannot separate yourself from them and they possess you. When you become aware of your emotions, you are in a position to change how the energy moving through your energy system is processed. When you are aware of your emotions and what is occurring around you, you step into the present moment. You take up residence in your mansion. The owner is in, the driver's awake at the wheel. All of the experiences of your life are designed to assist your movement into this position. Intimacy is the measure of the energy that leaves your energy system in love and trust. Lack of intimacy is the measure of the energy that leaves your energy system in fear and doubt. Intimacy and the lack of intimacy appear to be accidental experiences when you are not aware of your energy system and how it is working. When you are aware of your energy system and you know how it works, you can create intimacy when you choose. Intimacy does not mean a close relationship with another individual, although that can happen when you experience it. It also doesn't mean that others act in one particular way toward you or another. The experience of intimacy is not related to how others act or do not act, or how they speak or do not speak. It depends upon how energy leaves your energy system. When energy leaves your processing system in love and trust, the result is the experience of intimacy. Think of a time. Think of a time when you felt close to someone or a group of people. Perhaps it was at a family gathering where the truth was being told or when someone was dying and everyone was feeling so sad and also feeling so close or at a community tragedy that brought people in the community closer together. At these times there is a feeling of intimacy. This is a group experience of energy leaving each person in love and trust. Remember how you felt, the love you felt for each person, no matter what your past experiences were, the tenderness you felt for the people with you, and the warm, glowing feelings in your body. Remember that feeling. Most of your energy was leaving your body in love and trust in those moments. The second experience, lack of intimacy, is painful. People appear to you as objects. You're not interested in what they're feeling or thinking, except when it affects you. You're more concerned with things, such as a new car or a better job, than you are with people. Activities such as finishing a project or achieving a goal are more important to you than people. Everything is more important to you than people, unless you need them to accomplish what you want. Intimacy requires vulnerability. Being vulnerable does not require that you share every feeling of insecurity you have with another person or with anyone. It requires that you feel your every experience of insecurity. If you cannot feel your own insecurity, you will not be able to see them in others, much less appreciate them in others. When you are intimate, you become sensitive to yourself and also to other people. When you're not intimate, you are sensitive only to yourself. And even then, you're not aware of everything that you are feeling. Am I sensitive? Are you truly sensitive or are you too sensitive? Ask yourself, am I truly sensitive? I'm aware of other people's feelings, responsive to other people, seeing the situation clearly, interested in myself and others. Or too sensitive, taking things personally, reactive to other people, judging the circumstances, only interested in myself. Intimacy is natural for us. We long to experience intimacy and we are designed to be intimate, caring, sensitive, and loving toward one another. 
When you are intimate, you are fulfilled. Intimacy and the pursuit of external power, the ability to manipulate and control, are incompatible. When you naturally create harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life, you cannot suffer from lack of intimacy. When you do not recognize your deeper painful emotions for what they are, they shape your perceptions, judgments, and actions. Face your fears. For one day, experiment with noticing every painful emotion you have. Notice what physical sensations you're having and where they are in your energy system. Remember that all painful emotions are expressions of fear, such as anger, jealousy, sadness, vengefulness, and greed. They are emotions that come with thoughts of judging yourself and others. Intimacy is trusting that the universe will provide what you need, when you need it, and in the manner most appropriate for you. When I bring intimacy into my life, I become a friend to the world. The world is a friend to me. I welcome every circumstance instead of resisting it. Energy leaves my energy system in love and trust. I appreciate myself and others. When you change the question from how can I change others to how can I change myself, you consciously enter the earth school. You focus on the experience of painful emotions that are happening inside you and not what is happening outside of you. You focus on the experience of anger, not what makes you angry. The experience of jealousy, not what makes you jealous. The experience of sadness, not what makes you sad. The experience of fear in yourself, not what frightens you. You no longer run from your life and yourself. You welcome both as friends on the journey of your soul that began with your birth into the earth school and will end at the death of your personality when your soul goes home. Soul View When you turn your attention inward to patterns of emotional response, you begin to see that the same painful emotions occur in you again and again, although the triggers that activate them are different. It is the emotional response, not the trigger, that remains the same. Removing the trigger does not solve the problem. The pattern remains in place. Most people use their energy attempting to rearrange circumstances that trigger painful emotions. They change jobs, friends, and spouses. They choose new careers and houses. Changing external circumstances will not change your rigid patterns of emotional response. That requires looking at the patterns themselves. The medicine that your life offers you is your emotions. And using that medicine requires becoming intimately aware of your emotions, of the physical sensations that occur in your body and the thoughts that accompany them. In other words, paying attention to your energy system moment by moment is the healing medicine. Your patterns of emotional response have a life that is independent of particular external circumstances. You will continue to encounter circumstances that trigger painful emotions until you look beyond them to the interior dynamics that create your emotional pain. Anger. Now, anger is an iceberg phenomenon. It is the apex of a larger structure, all of which is invisible except the very top. Anger is the snow on the summit of an otherwise bare mountain. It is the view of the mountain that you would have if your eyes allowed you to see only snow, but no summit can exist without foothills, slopes, ravines, and ridges. There can be no summit 
without a mountain. In the same way, there's no such thing as anger without an immense emotional substructure. Anger is the peak protruding above the clouds. And beneath every experience of anger is a huge body of emotional experience. And without a clear view of that huge substructure, anger cannot be appreciated any more than a mountain can be appreciated by looking at a picture of the summit from the summit. From that perspective, the summit of the greatest mountain appears to be a small pile of rocks. Anger lashes out at a target. That target is another person, a group of people, or the universe. Anger is righteous and self-important. Anger does not listen to, respect, or care about others. It makes others wrong, to blame, inferior, or inadequate. It cares only about itself. Anger wants what it wants, when it wants it, on the terms that it wants it. It assumes the roles of judge, jury, and executioner. There is no appeal. Discovering anger in yourself or experiencing it in yourself, again, is like finding ancient pottery in the desert or the tops of temples that were built millennia ago and are now buried beneath the surface of the sand. And this is an archaeologist's greatest aspiration. It causes boundless excitement because where there is evidence of intelligence on the surface, there is sure to be much more below the surface. Anger is the pottery on the desert floor. It's the trace of a buried building. It points to much greater discoveries waiting to be revealed. It is the minor discovery compared with the larger treasures that lie beneath it, waiting to be unearthed. Now, most individuals who become angry frequently think that they are familiar with their emotions because of their outbursts. They are not. They do not know what they are feeling beyond the rage that roars through them like a storm, devastating all in its path until it exhausts itself and only damage remains. Angry outbursts are painful experiences, but they are not emotional explorations. Each outburst of anger is a barrier to the exploration of emotions. It's a fortress from which an individual who has no power does his or her best to face a frightening world. Some animals snarl, hiss, or growl when threatened by a larger animal. They cannot defend themselves, so they puff up, raise fur on their backs, and show teeth. Anger serves the same purpose in humans. All hostility originates in fear. Fear is the birthplace of every impulse that is not loving. A loving individual is fearless. An angry, jealous, vengeful, depressed, or avaricious person is filled with fear. The difference between being fearless and being fearful is the difference between being a life of fulfillment and a life of dissatisfaction. It is the chasm between meaning and purpose on one hand and despair and emptiness on the other. Love is fearless. It does not threaten any form of life. Love is a friend to all. It naturally nourishes, supports, and cares for others. It does not fight fear any more than the sun fights dark. It does not know fear. Where one is, the other cannot be. Anger prevents love and isolates the one who's angry. It is an attempt, often successful, to push away what is most longed for, companionship and understanding. It is a denial of the humanness of others, as well as a denial of your own humanness. Anger is the agony of believing that you are not capable of being understood and that you are not worthy of being understood. It's a wall that separates you from others. An angry individual appears not to be frightened at all. Actually, he or she is terrified. It's not courage that launches the attack, but uncontrollable terror. It's when a small animal cornered and defenseless hisses, snarls, and then attacks. 
And between terror and anger lies another experience, pain. In other words, beneath anger lies pain, and beneath that pain lies fear. Archaeological dig. Think of the last time you can remember getting angry. Remember the circumstance. Who and what you are angry at. Take a moment to go back to this time. Remember how you were feeling. What physical sensations were you having? Where in your energy system did you feel these sensations? What thoughts were you having or expressing? Open yourself to digging deeper, to feeling what was under your anger. Give yourself permission to feel the pain hidden underneath the anger. This is a practice you can do again and again. When you feel anger, gently allow yourself to go deeper, to dig beneath the anger. The more the pain is denied, the greater and more frequent is the anger that covers it. An individual who is continually angry is in continual pain. Anger is my resistance. Say this sentence a few times. I open myself to the possibility that anger is my resistance to experiencing my pain and my resistance to the world not being the way I want it to be. If it feels appropriate, practice saying this sentence every time you become angry. Rage is an excruciating experience of powerlessness. Striking out in rage is an act of powerlessness. Your anger is a clear, unmistakable signal that you are in pain. The universe is directing your attention to an inner dynamic that needs to be examined. The inner dynamic is not your anger. It is the cause of your anger. That's your pain. Challenging your anger begins the process of healing what causes it. And when you set the intention, for example, not to speak or act in anger no matter how angry you become, when you look for new ways to speak and act when you feel angry, you invoke the assistance of the universe and assistance comes to you. And that assistance will take you where you need to go in order to release your anger. That is your pain, the fundamental pain of the world not being the way you want your world to be. The pain of insisting that the wants of your personality are more important than the needs of your soul. The circumstances of your life always reflect the needs of your soul. If your dig is deep enough, you will discover the source of your pain. The world not being the way you want it to be. Making the wants of your personality more important than the needs of your soul. The core cause of anger is lack of self-worth. It's the experience of powerlessness. The universe provides you with opportunities again and again without cessation to move into the fullness of your power, into the unobstructed perception of your worth, value, and responsibilities. When you reach the bottom of your excavation, the final layer of lack of self-value, your anger reconfigures itself. It no longer seeks others to blame. It does not judge. Your anger becomes a positive force in your life that strives to unify rather than divide. You become a light that illuminates the darkness rather than a voice that condemns it. You bring change where no change was possible. You provide what is missing. Your anger guides you into ever more effective ways of understanding, communicating, and caring. You become a gift to yourself and others. Workaholism. Detachment is the difference between emotional involvement and emotional awareness. Detachment allows you to see your emotions as they form, develop, intensify, and change. Most people go through their lives from one iceberg strike to another, from anger 
to happiness, to jealousy, to fear, to vengefulness, back and forth and back again. Workaholism is one way of steaming full speed ahead without even posting a lookout, much less having sonar. Workaholism is a flight from emotions. It's a drug that is as effective as the most powerful anesthetic. And like all drugs, it cannot mask pain indefinitely. A patient using an anesthetic must take it regularly or it wears off. And the pain returns. Even if he takes the drug every hour, sooner or later, it loses its effectiveness. Then larger and larger doses are required to obtain the same results. Eventually, even large doses cannot mask the pain. Workaholism is magnetically attractive because it prevents the experience of any emotions. Do I or don't I? If you have a suspicion that what you are doing is compulsive, ask yourself, are my projects more important than the people involved? Am I frequently impatient when I am interrupted? Do I get overwhelmed emotionally by things I don't see coming? Do I never have enough time for all that I do? If your answer to any of these was yes, ask yourself, do I feel the same urgency with every job, project, or activity? Do I feel I need to work all the time? Am I fatigued but can't stop? Is my work more important than my family, friends, and the promises I make to others? Am I fixated on accomplishing things? Are my activities covering up my feelings and pain? Workaholism is the exploitation of people and circumstances in order to avoid pain. It's a narrow focus that precludes a larger landscape. It's the equivalent of putting on blinders so that all you see is the project or need in front of you. Your world becomes very small. You do not see others or what they're feeling, except when they affect what you are doing. You do not hear others or listen to what they are saying, except when what they say affects you. Friends, promises, and priorities all disappear into the self-satisfying, obsessive fixation on your job, career, or remodeling project. When you indulge in workaholism, you put strangers in charge of your life while you focus your attention on insignificant projects. Even if your project is to create an empire, it is insignificant compared to the creation of a meaningful, aware, compassionate, and fulfilling journey through the Earth School. Emotional awareness allows you to walk on the earth awake instead of in a self-imposed trance. Developing sonar. When you feel angry, stop what you're doing, what you're saying, and what you're thinking, and focus your attention on what you are feeling. This will not be easy, but it is worth your effort. When you are in the grip of a powerful emotion such as anger, and you stop speaking and acting and start feeling, you channel the full force of that energy into your consciousness. Choosing not to act on an angry impulse and to feel the pain that lies beneath it instead is very courageous. Even risking your life driving race cars or jumping out of airplanes does not require much courage compared to facing the pain beneath your anger. Most people do all the things that we usually think of as brave in order to avoid facing the pain they need to or do feel. Anger is an anesthetic. It hurts, but it is less painful than what causes it. Anger is the path of least resistance. It allows you to focus on the collision instead of learning about the mountain. Anger is a flight from feelings, like workaholism. That is why they go together.
Perfectionism. The perfect list. Make two lists. One of what is perfect in your life and one of what is not perfect. Make these lists as complete as you can. For example, perfect would be my kitchen. Not perfect is not enough money. Perfect is my son's cheerfulness. Not perfect is my daughter's anger. Perfect is my husband. Not perfect is my car. Perfect is my wife. Not perfect is my job. So picture the first item on your not perfect list clearly in your mind. Notice how you feel when you think about this non-perfect situation, thing, or person. What physical sensations are you feeling in your body? What energy locations are they near? Picture the second item on your not perfect list. Do the same thing. Notice what physical sensations you are feeling in your body and what energy locations they are near. Do this for each item on your not perfect list. When you're finished, do the same thing with each item on your perfect list. Notice how you feel when you think about each perfect situation, thing, or person. Make a note of the physical sensations you're feeling in your body and what energy locations they are near. Compare what you feel when you think about perfect situations, things, and people with what you feel when you think about situations, things, and people that are not perfect. Perfectionism is the assumption that the world is not perfect, and this assumption is incorrect. Every circumstance is perfect. Pristine nature and a garbage dump are both perfect. The first is a perfect example of the plant and animal domains developing together naturally without human disturbance. The second is a perfect example of exploitation and lack of reverence. The first reveals perfectly the balance and beauty that surrounds us naturally. The second illustrates perfectly how we can disrupt that balance. Perfectionism assumes that one choice is better than the other. All choices create perfect consequences. Some choices create consequences that are more destructive than consequences created by other choices. Some choices create consequences that are more nurturing, but all choices create consequences that are perfect, consequences that could not have been otherwise given the choices that created them. Striving to avoid imperfection is useless. There is no such thing as imperfection. Every circumstance is perfect given the choices that created it. You can only choose which perfect circumstances among countless ones you will create. When you judge one circumstance to be superior to another, you confuse your preferences with perfection. They're not the same. What you prefer is not superior to what others prefer. What you create with your choices is not superior to the creations of others. When you attempt to impose your preferences on others, you do not create a world that is more perfect. You create a world of insensitive imposition. Whether you honor others or impose yourself, the consequences you create are the perfect products of your choice. When you honor others, your life fills with joy, gratitude, and appreciation. You bloom like a flower in the spring. When you impose yourself on others, your heart closes. You live in fear. Your preferences become a painful fortress, and you keep those who do not share them outside. The pursuit of external power, the ability to manipulate and control, is insisting that the circumstances you prefer are perfect for others. But it only creates violence and destruction. Honoring the preferences of others creates harmony, sharing, and cooperation. It reveres life. That is the pursuit of authentic power, the alignment of the personality with the soul. When you can see clearly the relationship between the choices you have made and the circumstances around you, you will see the perfection of your circumstances. Then you will be able to change them. Perfection. Now when you do something that you feel is not perfect, something that you would usually be upset with yourself about, such as locking the key in your car or losing your wallet, stop and notice what you are feeling and where you are feeling it in your energy system. 
Then say to yourself, I am so glad that I have done this perfectly. When someone, especially someone close to you, does something you usually judge as not perfect, notice what physical sensations you are having in your body and where you feel them in your energy system. At the same time, say to yourself, I am so glad to have this perfect person or circumstance to teach me about myself. The dynamic that creates your circumstances is not random. You are that dynamic. You create continually and perfectly. Whether you make your choices consciously or unconsciously, you create circumstances and experience them. This dynamic is perfect. The circumstances that you create are perfect because they always reflect your choices. Every circumstance offers you an opportunity to see the relationship between it and the choices that created it, the choices you have made. Perfectionism is an intellectual exercise that draws attention away from emotions and prevents the exploration of your creative power. It is an attempt to inhabit an imaginary world in order to avoid experiencing the world in which you live. Frustrate the need. If you're a perfectionist, stop what you're doing when the urge is strong to rearrange, continue late into the night or expand the domain that needs to be perfect, and feel what you are feeling. Your first experience will be an almost irresistible need to proceed with what you are doing. Ignoring what need will immediately create painful experiences within you. When you frustrate the need to create perfection, you will experience the pain that creates it. If you are a workaholic, stop when the amount and urgency of what you have to do seems overwhelming and you will experience a pain so intense that the need to recommence your work will be almost uncontrollable. Let yourself feel it. Experiencing the world in which you live requires your heart. You cannot grasp it with your intellect and your five senses. Perfectionism is the opposite of emotional awareness. Emotional awareness is relaxing into the present moment, even when the present moment contains painful emotions. It is allowing everything you are feeling into your consciousness. Pleasing. The desire to please other people is a potent way to distract yourself from what you are feeling. While you are trying to avoid the displeasure of others, you are in extreme displeasure yourself. You are tense and ready for the worst. Your focus is on other people and what they are experiencing. You ignore your own experiences except those of anxiety and fear. The impulse to please other people is a powerful dynamic that is generated by fear of loss. You think that you cannot live without that which you are fearing losing. And so the need to gain the approval, admiration, caring, and love of other people is intense. Emotionally, it is life and death matter. When other people show displeasure, it creates terror in you, which is extremely painful. It contracts the muscles, accelerates pulse and respiration, and focuses attention narrowly, among many other things. All that matters is pleasing another or others. The desire to please is an attempt to change others in order to make the one who pleases feel better. Healing the need to please or uncontrollable anger is a sacred task. An authentically empowered personality naturally creates harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. You cannot create these when you are trying to please someone. The intention to become what you think another person wants you to be disrupts harmony, even though it may temporarily reduce tension. It prevents cooperation and sharing. You cannot express creativity, except those parts of yourself that you think will be welcomed. An individual who needs to please is always tense. Anxiety is his constant companion. Imagine someone who's always with you, who always brings your attention to possible disasters. He's never quiet. Wherever you go, you hear your friend speaking close to your ear. Other conversations may occur around you, but you cannot hear them. He is the only one with a voice that you can hear. Emotional awareness requires listening to many conversations simultaneously. 
How pleasing is your pleasing? Think of a time when you knew you were trying to please someone. Remember this occasion clearly. How are you feeling? Notice where you're feeling tension. Is it in your neck? Is it in your shoulders? Do you have a headache? Is your chest tight? What thoughts are accompanying these sensations? If you were able to please someone in this situation, how did that make you feel? If you were not able to please anyone, how did that make you feel? Next time you feel the urge to please someone, stop to feel. Notice where you're feeling tightness and tension. Notice what other physical sensations you're feeling. Where are you feeling them and what thoughts are you thinking? One who pleases places his self-worth into the hands of others and depends completely upon their judgment while doing his best to influence their judgment. Why am I pleasing? If you find yourself wanting to please, stop and allow yourself to feel what is beneath the surface. Notice when you find yourself sensing what someone else is feeling. Ask yourself, am I feeling love and trust or fear? Stop and feel what you're feeling. Are you interested in how that person is feeling because you would feel more secure if he or she would do what you want him or her to do? Or say what you want to hear? Pleasing prevents you from experiencing your emotions because you're attempting to feel the emotions that other people are experiencing. You become lost in the attempt. You feel judged by one, disapproved by another, accepted by a third, and so on. So your own emotions are inaccessible to you because you are focused elsewhere. You cannot please and, at the same time, Breathe freely, relax into your life, express your creativity, and appreciate yourself and others. Vacating. Vacating is daydreaming, absent-mindedness, and inability to keep focused on the task at hand. When you vacate, the work you leave behind is the work you were born to do. Your soul is interested in how you use your energy, what you create, and whether you move into your highest potential. It sees the experiences of your life as a part of a larger, richer, more complete picture than you can see. It sees patterns of connection that bind you to everyone whose path crosses you, however intimately or briefly. Vacating is a way of keeping yourself from all that will bring meaning, purpose, and fulfillment into your life. When you vacate your awareness of the present moment, the present moment continues. It has no end and no beginning, but your time on the earth does. Vacating is a pattern of indulging impulses that distract you in order to avoid what you would feel if you allowed yourself to become aware of your emotions. How do you vacate? At the end of each day, take five minutes to go through your day. And think about when you got distracted. Remember how you were feeling before, during, and after the distraction. Beneath each of the experiences are painful emotions that you do not want to approach or even acknowledge. Your distractions keep you from them for only so long. Then these emotions explode into your life as anger, fear, distrust, jealousy, self-doubt, and the many ways that lack of self-worth expresses itself. The issue is your own spiritual growth. The universe always provides you assistance. Vacating the present moment is one way of avoiding the assistance the universe provides you. When you flee from the experience of your emotions, your emotions do not stop. Your energy system is your personal, real-time, always-available spiritual tutor. Take five minutes at the beginning of each day. Do a quick scan of your energy system. Pay attention to the information that your spiritual tutor, your energy system, is giving you. Practice listening to your spiritual tutor throughout the day. That information is your emotions. Every emotion is designed to inform you about how you are processing energy in your energy system so that you can choose to continue the same way or change. If you continue the same way, the same painful emotions are produced. Absenting yourself from the present moment 
delays your discovery of what is not healthy in your life, but it does not prevent it. It is an attempted detour around what cannot be avoided. All efforts to distract attention from them have been ineffective. The root of boredom is resistance to painful emotions. This is the root of workaholism and perfectionism also. In some cases, the root produces boredom first and then an escape into workaholism or perfectionism. In other cases, the workaholism or perfectionism comes first and then boredom. You were not born to lose yourself in activities. Your purpose on the earth is to give the gifts that your soul desires to give, those that create harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life, no matter what form they take. Am I avoiding? List your daily activities, for example, eating and snacking, judging, exercising, worrying, gardening. Look at each activity one by one. Ask yourself, how can I use this activity to become emotionally aware? When you engage in one of these activities, remember to stop and do a quick scan of your energy system. Boredom is your fuller life calling to you and your fear of hearing the call. Living in the present moment requires awareness of all that you're feeling, of how your energy system is functioning moment by moment. Workaholics and perfectionists pour their energy into external circumstances. Bored people pour their energy into avoiding them. Authentic power is the alignment of your personality with your soul. It requires locating and changing the parts of your personality that are not aligned with your soul. Your soul longs for harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. The parts of your personality that oppose these intentions are the parts that are frightened. They are the parts that are angry, vengeful, jealous, depressed, compulsive, obsessed, and addicted. Lack of self-worth, powerlessness, pain. So, I can either explore the pain or avoid the pain. Are you bored? Think of the last time you were talking to someone you wished you were not talking to. What did you do? Make an excuse to leave? Continue to pretend to listen? Use the situation as an opportunity to feel what you are feeling? Think of a time when you went somewhere you did not want to go. What did you do? Become impatient, judgmental, angry at those who made you go? Leave as quickly as you could? Use the situation as an opportunity to feel what you were feeling. Boredom is the opposite of reverence. Reverence is appreciation of everyone and everything just because it is. It is seeing beyond the shell of appearance and into essence. Boredom prevents you from appreciating people, circumstances, and the opportunities for spiritual growth. It keeps you from the experience of your energy system. It prevents you from revering others, the earth and yourself. Boredom invites you to wake to the power of your life and the complexity of your experiences and the beneficence of the universe. Idol worship. Idol worship is venerating an image. It's paying homage to or being dominated by an ideal. The worshipped image is perfect and powerful. It towers above mundane events and activities. The idol represents abilities not available to everyone. By gaining the favor of the idol, the worshipper obtains an easier life or relief from pain. The image holds a great deal of power to the worshiper. The idol that most people worship, even if they are very religious and bow before statues of deities and saints daily, is not on an altar or pedestal. It's not housed in a building or kept in a garden. 
the idol that most people worship every day and every night is an image inside themselves of what they think they are or what they think they should be. For many people, that idol is an ideal father. For others, it is an ideal mother. For some, it is an ideal teacher or an ideal friend. Some people worship the idol of an ideal soldier. Others, the idol of an ideal student. The idol is the role the worshiper thinks she must play. An idol worshiper does not think her activities are valuable, except when they satisfy the idol she worships. She strives to be a role. Fulfilling that role gives her satisfaction and self-worth. If she cannot fulfill the role, she becomes depressed. She feels that she's a failure. She cannot appreciate herself apart from her ability to live her role. The function of idol worship is to avoid living your life directly and fully. Idol worship places a screen between you and your experiences. On that screen, you see yourself in a way that you believe is admirable. Your responses to circumstances are distorted by your need to fulfill your role. What idols do you worship? What roles do you play in your life that keep you from true connection? Allow yourself to look closely at all the roles you play, such as business person, wife, parent, good person, athlete, etc. Take each role one at a time and spend some time imagining yourself in your role. Notice what you're feeling. Where is your energy system? Are you having physical sensations? And what thoughts are accompanying those sensations? It's okay if you do not get in touch at first with any feelings in your body. Be patient. An idol worshiper ignores his or her inner signals and acts as she thinks she should act. Those inner signals are her emotions. Idol worship justifies disregarding what you feel. If an emotion does not fit the role you think you must play, the idol you worship, you attempt to substitute an emotion you think you should feel. The idol you worship is an image of what you think you must be in order to be safe, admired, or valuable. Why idols? While thinking about one of your roles, ask yourself the following questions. Why did I create this role? Did I create this role to be beautiful, handsome, lovable, admired, appreciated? Did I create this role to feel more worthy, feel less vulnerable, cover my fear? Ask yourself these questions again while imagining yourself in each one of your roles, one at a time. Give yourself adequate time to explore these questions. The idol worshiper does not have the courage to open himself or herself to love. So he or she mistakes admiration for love. Why my role? Are you looking at each role you play? As you look at each role you play, put yourself in that role. While you are imagining yourself in each role, scan your energy system. Look for what physical sensations you are having, especially if you have not noticed them before. Ask yourself, does the role I am playing give me a feeling of satisfaction and self-worth? Do I appreciate myself apart from this role? How do I feel about myself when I'm not in this role? Do I divert attention away from my emotions in order to fill the requirements of my role? A glorious life requires the courage to face the most difficult challenge that a human can face, the pain of powerlessness, of feeling unloved and unlovable and to change. No idol worshiper, not even a daredevil, has the courage to do that. ...for his life and does not look forward to it. He is frightened of his emotions. He cannot consider that he has created destructive consequences, that his life is 
not the way that he wants it to be. And that his pain is real. He lives in a fantasy. In his fantasy, all is for the best. And this means to him that in some vague way he will accomplish the goals he desires. His greatest fear is that he will never accomplish them. Impenetrable optimism is the story of sour grapes lived again and again in the life of an individual. A fox saw some red, ripe grapes hanging invitingly from a vine high above him. No matter how high he leaped, he could not quite reach the lowest of them. At last, in exhaustion, he decided to himself, those grapes are probably sour anyway. Like the fox, an impenetrable optimism cannot face the pain of wanting the grapes very much and not being able to get them. He's not willing to acknowledge that the grapes are probably as delicious as they look and that he still is not going to get them. When an impenetrable optimist cannot get what she wants, he or she believes that he or she does not want it. The opposite is true. She wants it, but she cannot get it. And not getting it is a painful experience for her. She sees herself as carefree, but she is not. Her concerns are as important to her as the concerns of others are for them. The difference is that she cannot acknowledge the depths of what she feels. She'd rather pretend that she is not disappointed than feel the pain of her disappointment. An impenetrable optimist uses optimism to shield herself from painful emotions. It is impenetrable because she is unwilling to face the realities of her circumstances. She pretends they are not as difficult as they are. She sees herself as a victim at the mercy of forces she cannot control, but she will not allow herself to feel the pain of being a victim. She pushes aside the powerful emotions of sorrow, despair, anger, fear, jealousy. She presents to herself and others the appearance of happy acceptance. Eventually, the discrepancy between the pain she feels and the image she projects becomes so large that she cannot maintain the image. The shallowness of her life cannot be denied. Despair follows that is too great to be ignored, and a healing crisis begins. An impenetrable optimist barricades herself from her emotions. Behind the assumption that all is for the best, that assumption is correct, the crisis occurs because she uses that assumption to barricade herself from her emotions. At last, the emotions that she attempts to ignore confront her with a force she cannot ignore. Until then, she cannot begin the process of learning about her energy system, which functions with or without with or without her awareness. It produces emotions, physical sensations, in response to each circumstance that she encounters. These emotions are accompanied by thoughts. The impenetrable optimist ignores all of this, but none of this ignores her. Impenetrable optimism is not the same as the optimism that is born when an individual becomes aware of the compassion and wisdom of the universe. That optimism grows like a plant in the spring, always deepening its roots and gaining strength. When it flowers, all is for the best because When it flowers, all is for the best becomes a description, not a motto. That kind of optimism requires awareness of your emotions. Your emotions anchor you in your soul. They tell you what your soul wants you to know. You can pretend all is for the best, but if you fear your anger, fear, jealousy, and vengefulness, you do not Believe it. When you welcome your emotions as teachers, every emotion brings good news, even emotions that are painful. They tell you whether energy is leaving your energy system in fear and doubt or in love and trust. Are you really that cheerful? Do people say to you, how can you be so happy all the time? 
or I admire how cheerful you are all the time. Do you feel that no matter what, you need to have a good attitude? Is this describing you or are you strongly reacting or disliking it? If your answer to any of these questions is yes, here's a practice for you. Think of a time recently when you did not get what you wanted and you said to yourself or others, well, it was all for the best. But you knew deep down that you did not feel that way. Feel yourself in that situation again. Stop. Do a scan of your energy system. Give yourself some time to feel. If you do not feel anything this time, scan your energy system whenever you do not get something that you really want. For example, affection from a friend, a hello from a stranger that you said hello to, or a raise at your job. Do this practice again. The more you do it, the more you will discover about yourself. It's a perception that you are fundamentally superior. When others do not share your perception, you feel unappreciated. Your feeling of entitlement does not depend upon skill or talent. You feel that you are entitled to what you desire, even if you are not willing to do what is necessary to obtain it, or have not developed the abilities necessary to obtain it. Entitlement is a denial. Denial does not mean refusal to admit what you know. It is blindness. It is not realizing something important about yourself. Until you learn what you deny, you cannot be free of it. If you deny a fear, you cannot free yourself of that fear until you experience it. You will create painful consequences and then be surprised by them. Entitlement prevents intimacy. Lack of intimacy creates isolation. Isolation creates the experience of being unappreciated. Beneath entitlement is terror of ridicule and rejection. Entitlement requires the appearance of invulnerability. The more frightened you are, the more entitled you feel yourself to be. It's like a stuffed toy that a child holds in the dark. The darker the room becomes, the more important the toy becomes to the child. Only lighting the room can remove the child's fear. Only removing the child's fear can remove its need for the toy. The toy is your feeling of entitlement. Exploring entitlement. As you hear this chapter, do you see yourself? Do you feel strongly, this is not I? Do you recognize this as the behavior of someone you know? If you answer yes to the first two questions, entertain the possibility that you are frightened. Do a quick scan. Be gentle with yourself and open yourself to clearly seeing this fear. Repeat this practice each time you feel entitled. If you answered yes to the third question, entertain the idea that someone you know who is described in this chapter is frightened or he or she would not be acting this way. Problem that must be addressed if the symptoms are to be removed permanently. If the symptoms are treated in isolation from their cause, they will reappear and continue to reappear as long as their cause remains unchanged. The cause of alcoholism and drug addiction is intense emotional pain. Finding and healing the cause of emotional pain is the core of spiritual growth. It is the work each individual in the earth school was born to do. The causes of emotional pain are parts of the personality that are not aligned with the soul. And these are parts that are in opposition to the intentions of the soul. Harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. They have their own agendas, values, perceptions, and methods. All of them produce painful consequences and painful emotions. Every painful emotion points the way to a part of the personality that does not share the elevated perceptions of the soul. Every experience of sorrow, despair, vengefulness, jealousy, resentment, 
anger and fear is a signpost painting toward a part of the personality that languishes in lack of trust. Beneath alcoholism and drug addiction lie layers upon layers of emotional pain. Alcoholism and drug addiction are the outermost layers. They cover emotional pain, which covers more intense emotional pain. The permanent healing of an addiction is also the permanent healing of a part of the personality that is consumed with shame and fear. Healing an addiction, including addiction to alcohol and drugs, requires an inward journey through your greatest inadequacies. Every moment of emotional pain is a place to start the journey, and these potential starting places are gifts from the universe and messages from your soul. The next doorway. Imagine yourself in the next situation where you would decide whether or not to take a drink or take a drug. Say to yourself, will I do what I usually do in this situation, or will I see what is behind the doorway if I do not take this drink or this drug? Now allow yourself to feel your energy system as you contemplate this question. What physical sensations are you feeling, and where are you feeling them? Experiment with the practice. Do it frequently. Then try it in real time when you want to take that drink or that drug. Only you can extinguish the source of your emotional pain. The emotional pain that produces more emotional pain and addiction is a calling from your soul. Alcohol and drugs are ways of ignoring the calls for an hour, a day, a month, or a lifetime, but they cannot stop the calls. Sex. Your energy system provides you with information continuously about how it is processing energy. That information is your emotions. Obsession with sexual interactions is a way of keeping that information from your awareness. Every interaction generates emotions. When your focus is on sex, your ability to experience your emotions is reduced or incapacitated. Addictive sexual attraction is a defense against awareness of the most painful experience in the earth school, the experience of being powerless. It is the terror of feeling unloved and unlovable. It's the fear of being discovered at your core to be inadequate and ugly, the fear of being rejected and alone. The stronger these emotions are, when there is no willingness to feel them, the stronger becomes the obsession with sex. An addictive sexual attraction is an unwillingness, an unwillingness to experience painful emotions. A sexual addict is an individual in acute pain. He or she is consumed by feelings of inadequacy. Some sexual addicts are controlled by a need to please others, and some have violent fantasies and explosive anger. Some seek revenge and cannot achieve it. Their lives are empty and lonely. They are resentful and bitter. The pain of each individual is an expression of his or her unique life and the decisions that he or she has made, but the depth of the pain of anyone in the grip of a sexual addiction is great. Experiences of addictive sexual attraction can be continual and intense, occupying almost every thought, or they can be in the background of awareness and only activated by the appearance of a potential sexual partner. The experience of addictive sexual attraction is a flag that signals a craving for meaning, purpose, and value. Unraveling a sexual addiction. Stage one, denial. I am just a loving person. Maybe there's something to look at. It's not a problem, but I'll look at it if you're upset about it. Stage two, acceptance. There is something there. This could be a problem. All right, maybe there's a problem. Okay, there's a problem. This is a big problem. 
Stage 3, opening to healing. I am out of control. An individual who feels powerless, frightened, unwanted, unlovable, and without worth has an internal radar. And this radar scans every room that he enters for a particular target, another individual who feels as powerless as he. And when he locates such a person, he feels a sexual attraction. He's not aware of feeling powerless, frightened, unwanted, or unlovable. He feels sexually attracted. He is certain that the person in front of him has activated his attraction. Yet something very different has been ignited within him, the need to use another person to create relief, even if only for a moment, of the pain of feeling frightened, unwanted, without worth, and the other excruciating experiences of powerlessness. He does not realize that the person to whom he's attracted is his counterpart. The more intense the pain of fear, unworthiness, and feeling unlovable becomes, the more obsessive becomes the need to have a sexual interaction. If you do not imagine these qualities in yourself, you imagine them in, in the other person. You imagine that he is desirable, sexy, and attractive. You put him on... You put him or her on a pedestal and you feel secure doing that. This is not accurate either. The person to whom you are attracted does not hold himself or herself in esteem any more than you honor yourself. That is why addictive sexual interactions are barriers to intimacy, even though they appear to be intimate. How is intimacy possible when individuals involved are exploiting one another? How can any of them be vulnerable, share what is important, explore their feelings, and appreciate the other? They cannot, because addictive sexual interactions are encounters in which the participants do not care about each other. This is an arena devoid of empathy and tenderness. Each participant sees his or her partner as interchangeable with other sexual partners. Each is affixed to each other, just as alcohol is affixed to an alcoholic and heroin to a heroin addict. Each sexual addict is both predator and prey, seducer and seduced. Each feeds on the other. Emotions and sexual addiction. If you feel you're sexually addicted and you want to find the origin of this addiction, it's important to be gentle with yourself. Remember the last time you were sexually attracted to someone? Remember how you felt? Excitement at the thought of having sex with him or her? Were you also aware of your fear? Stay with that time. Do a scan of your energy system. What are you feeling? Where are you feeling it? What thoughts are accompanying your physical sensations? The next time you meet someone you are attracted to sexually, go deeper than the excitement and fear you feel about a sexual interaction with this person. Scan your energy system. Allow yourself to feel your attraction. Allow yourself also to feel what is beneath it instead of acting on it. In loving sexual intimacy, sexual partners are not interchangeable. They are unique in their histories, aptitudes, struggles, and joys. They know each other and care for each other. They empathize. They are interested in each other. They use physical intimacy to deepen their emotional intimacy. They laugh with each other. They pay attention to what they feel. They are committed to growing together. Their sexual interactions are sacred to them, and they are sacred to each other. It is impossible to have a sexual interaction without deepening the emotional connection between the partners. Beyond Stress Stress is the consequence of resistance. It is not caused by circumstances in your life. It's not caused by the painful emotion you experience either. It is caused by your resistance to your life. It is possible for you to encounter a wide variety of circumstances, but it is your resistance to those circumstances that causes stress. When you resist a circumstance in your life, it takes energy, and that produces stress. The amount of stress in your life is determined by how much energy you expend resisting your life. Stressed out? Write down everything you can think of that you feel stressed about. For example, 
my mate's habits, lack of time, color of my car, my child's behavior, my parents, my boss, my busy schedule. Save this list. When you accept the circumstances in your life, you do not squander your energy resisting them. Resistance is the loss of energy that results when you attempt, with your thoughts and your feelings, to change a person, event, or circumstance. You reach out with your energy to make that person or experience different than it is. Stressed out. Now go back to your list of circumstances, things, and people that you feel stressed about. Consider each of the items on it, one at a time. For each item, scan your energy system. What physical sensations are you feeling and where are they located? Write down what you discover. Is energy leaving your energy system in love and trust or in fear and doubt? Then say to yourself, these are the circumstances, things. These are the circumstances, things, and people that I resist in my life. And my resistance to them is what causes my stress. No amount of energy can change the circumstances in your life in the moment that you experience them or the people with whom you interact. There is no if or but to that. When a circumstance in your life does not meet your approval, it is nonetheless what it is. You lose energy by resisting it. And the consequence is the experience of stress. Resisting the circumstances of your life is the same as saying to a river, you should not be flowing here. You should be flowing over there. The more you distress yourself over the course of the river, the more energy you lose. You see the river and where it is flowing. You do not like what you see. Resistance is the second part of this equation. You do not like what you see. Seeing the river and where it flows does not produce stress. Not liking what you see does. Not liking what you see is a loss of energy, not the sight of the river. The flowing river is what you see. The rest is what you add to what you see. When you add dislike, distrust, fear, disdain, disapproval, or any other judgment, you lose energy. And that loss of energy is the experience of stress. Accepting the river as it flows is relief from stress. Relief from stress is freedom. It is the ability to breathe deeply and enjoy the river. It is relaxing into the present moment. Resist your experience. Resist your present moment. Resist your life. Equaling stress. To change your life, you must accept your life. And this appears to be a paradox, but it is not. Once you accept your life, greet it without resistance, you can determine what you need to change in order to create the circumstances and experiences that you desire. Accepting your life means being present in it, moment by moment. Changing your life begins with accepting your life as it is. When you do that, you are in a position to change. You know where you are in addition to where you want to go. Moving beyond. Return again to the list of circumstances, things and people that you feel stressed about. Consider each of the items on it, one at a time. And as you do, say to yourself, I open to the possibility that I can accept this circumstance, thing or person, the way it or he or she is. Spend some time really opening to this possibility. Does this change the physical sensations in your body and where you are feeling them? The first step in changing the dynamic that creates an emotion is to experience the emotion. Resisting an emotion prevents you from exploring it. When you accept your emotions, they flow through you like air through a flute. You feel them, which allows you to learn from them. They show you where energy leaves your energy system and how. 
Your emotions are friends who bring news that you need to know. Resisting them closes the door to that news. It also produces stress. Resistance to your life is a lack of trust in the universe. You approve of some of your experiences, but not all of them. When you do not approve, energy leaves you in fear and doubt. You insist on the perceptions, values, and goals of your personality. You ignore the perceptions, values, and goals of your soul. This is painful. Your journey through the Earth School provides you with opportunities to align your personality with your soul. And these opportunities continue from the time you are born until the time you die. When you use them to align your personality with your soul, you create authentic power. Authentic power is freedom from fear and awareness of your creative power as a soul. It is appreciation of the wisdom and compassion of the universe. That is life without stress. You value your experiences. Use them to guide you in the creation of authentic power. And all the while, you do not resist the process. The process includes resistance. When you accept your life, you accept all all that you experience. You accept your resistance also. You become at last a compassionate and patient friend with yourself. Creating that friendship begins with emotional awareness.